Welcome back. I'm Rich Folley. This is AWP 2016, the Association of Writers and Writing Programs, and we, you're watching PBS Book View now. I'm very proud and pr privileged to be sitting right now with Jamal May, a fellow Detroiter. Great to have you here. Yeah, Welcome. It's really, really good to be here. Man. Yeah. We were just talking about your book releasing here at AWP, a new collection of poems called The Big Book of Exit Strategies. Yeah. And just came out here at AWP. Yeah, it did. Yeah. And they can't keep it in stock. It's moving. No, it was, they, they, um, they were almost sold out the first day. I think yeah. they sold the rest the next day. Yeah. That's the beauty of AWP, man. There's a lot of great poets here, and it's a big part of AWP. Yeah, it is. Have you been to other AW, AWPs previously? Yeah, I've been to a few in a row now. And this is the third year um, that I've been here as also a pub as publisher, because I have a small childbook press I run with Tarfia Faizula. And, um, and so maybe like six in a row now, I think. I yeah. just realized how many I've been to this morning. Yeah. Talk to me a little bit about organic art. It's, the, uh, your, it's, it's organic weapon arts is the name yeah. of your publishing company? Yeah, correct. Yeah, tell yeah. me about that. And when did okay. you start that? So that was founded six years ago, 2010. Um, the idea was basically the notion that I kind of looked at overhead and like I was like, okay, I think nowadays like books can pretty much pay for themselves if you're not trying to make a million dollars, you know? Yeah. Like um, small ch and chapbook format is something I was really interested in. Um, Explain chapbook so for people who chap don't know. But so um, chapbook is kind of short for chapter book, yeah. and it's a, a kind of a not a full length collection. So in poetry, it'll be a book that's less than 48 pages. Um, and so um, the, pro the format was something I just loved. I had a chapbook come out on Pudding House that did really well. And so I ended up doing um, another chapbook um, and using the funds for that to publish Francine J. Harris, um, for our first chapbook, who's also a Detroiter. And then that did it better than we expected, and we were able to kind of like expand what we were doing from there. Um, Javier Zamora won our first chapbook prize, and um, and and every author we've kind of had come through has kind of gone on to do all, all lots of cool stuff. And we keep just drawing fantastic poets like Ross Gay and Amy Nizuka Matado, Rachel McKibbins. Um, yeah. yeah, we just had Ross here earlier today. Oh, great. Tell us about Detroit and the role Detroit has played in your own poetry, and also just your uh, the scene that's sort of starting to to grow up around Detroit. You're one of the big names in that scene, but there are others, and there's something sort of special happening there, and, and it's a little different than other towns and their sort of literary scenes. Yeah, yeah, Detroit has influenced my work like in a crazy number of ways. Um, when I look at it now, I really see um, aesthetically the, the parts I move around. I kind of do a lot of different things, and Detroit kind of has a lot of parts. I think of it as a city of parts. It's one mechanism, but if you're on like the east side by Mac and B, where you're, doing, you're seeing something totally different than if you're downtown or if you're on the northwest side. It's a very, very sprawling city with a lot of variation. And I noticed that my work kind of jumps around in those ways where it kind of moves in a lot of places but still has a, a core. Like there's a syntax to Detroit, you know. There's like yeah. an order of operations that happens. And uh, my poetry is very kind of centered around what I can do with syntax. Um, and then from just um, as an artist, um, being in a city where, you know, in the 90s, they slashed arts funding in Michigan like crazy. So um, you were, uh, when I was kind of, uh, now we have a lot more coming into the city um, funding wise but uh, we still have this thing where in Detroit where if you were making art it, it really was kind of a uh, working class kind of sensibility with it and I, that's definitely in my work and, and then of course Vivi Francis is a Detroit poet who I probably wouldn't I wouldn't be doing any of this if it wasn't for our mentorship in 2000 starting in 2006 um, her and her husband Matthew Oldsman um, were really hugely influential in my approach. How my did they, style. I mean, how were they influential and, and what yeah. led you to poetry? So um, I came through poetry first through the slam. My twin sister was a lover of poetry and was trying, she saw something in me that she thought, she's like, you should do this. And I was terrified of crowds, uh, being around lots of people, uh, didn't express myself well <laughs> necessarily. And I took it as a challenge to grow as a person. I was like, if I can do slam, if I can go into the slam and write something and do it, you know? And so that was my first entry was just like challenging myself to do what I couldn't do. And then from there, I saw a version of me that I didn't know and wanted to know more about. And I just kind of followed the work. And the work led me to Vivi in 2006. So that was 2004 when I started. 2006, um, I got, start, got to work with Vivi, started studying contemporary poetry specifically, reading like all the great writers who are doing the, their thing right now, and then kind of working my way backwards through the canon. Um, and that was kind of my entry into it, like first entry into it. But now when I look back, I think the thing on a deeper level, what draws me, drew me to poetry was this idea that I could build a mechanism to approximate emotion. Because uh, I felt it, but I couldn't really, I had 
problems connecting with folks growing up. And uh, with poetry, uh, there was this thing I could build that could show something I'm looking at, but there's space for the reader to look or the listener to look, and they have their own experience, and it becomes a conduit between people. And I think that's what drew me to it for, in a more philosophical way. Yeah, you talked about you talk a lot about the space in between things, and I yeah. guess that sort of ties into what you just said, and the sort of friction there, and that's yeah, where yeah. sort of all the magic happens. Yeah, the for push you. and pull. Yeah. Yeah, and so to me, that when I, I really got thinking about that, um, the idea of mining that space and how yeah. you go in there and as a, as a discipline how do you settle into that space and know what's in there okay so i think of it a lot of ways i think of it is by looking at duality um if you look at my work there's a ton of like this is true and this is also true and i kind of and the, and well basically when you put two things together you get friction like you said and when you get friction you get torque and when you get torque, you can move things. And I'm kind of old-fashioned enough to think, like, I want poems to move people, you know? And so I look for things that press up against each other and then try to find, like, the commonalities between them. And the way this makes plays out in the work is, some, is a lot of times is um, I'll use negation a lot. Like, I'll, um, I'll create a metaphor and then say, no, it's not that. But I've already created that metaphor. So you get a space where two things get to be true at once. And that's what I really love about the poem. It's, it's almost multidimensional how more than one thing can be true inside of a poem. And so I look at, um, so from a writing standpoint, I'm always looking at the, from diction, syntax, like how these, um, and content, like how these things, and music, of course, like how these things press and pull against each other and with each other to kind of create something new that's in between all of it. It's like a mechanical element almost. It very, strikes yeah. me as very Detroit. And if you look at the, the covers of your books, Hum and the Big Book of Exit Strategies, it, it, it seems like the covers are pulling from that same idea. Definitely. So how did you pick these? And you told me that they were the same artist who did both covers. Yeah, so the artist's name is Brian Despain. And um, Francine J. Harris, who I mentioned, she showed me his artwork years ago because she saw an affinity between his artwork and what I was doing. Um, and this is, I didn't have many poems from, from home back when I found out about this artist. Um, but I started looking into his work and there was both whimsy and melancholy and it was something I hadn't seen in a lot of work. And, and, you know, it was played up even more when I was actually looking for artwork for the book because I knew for the first book I wanted a vexing quiet. That's the name of the painting on the cover of um, Hum. And um, Alice James, the way they do it is they give authors tons of c control over the, the art. But you have to select a lot of, like, a few pieces from different artists so that we can have a conversation if, if the piece isn't working. Um, but when I was trying to find other artists that did what Brian Desmain did, it was really challenging because I could find people that were playing with the mechanical or whimsical kind of thing, but they didn't have that weird underneath melancholy. I could find melancholic stuff, but I couldn't find that mechanical joy, too. And there was something about his artwork that I saw both things happening in. And so it was really, I was really excited when I got it for the first book. And then with the second book, because they're in conversation, but doing different things, I wanted to go to some of his artwork that was had more contrast and more dynamics to it, but still was Brian Despain. And if you look at the covers, you can kind of see almost all the elements in the first cover are kind of represented in the new one, but differently. Yeah. Like the egg in the hand is now the of the full-grown egg head. Yeah. The mechanical machine is starting to become human. There's a human hand moving from underneath the robe. There are birds in the background and a dead bird in the cage. Now the birds are free and in the foreground with the halos. I mean, there's a conversation between the books, and uh, so I wanted a conversation between the artwork. Yeah, it's very cool. And the, and the art is so important to it, but so is the, uh, the notion of music, which I, I know you're a sound engineer. Yeah. And again, the sort of mechanical side of music. You're, yeah. You play guitar too, but you, you talked about sort of the engineering side, yeah. which struck me is also thematic for you, you know, sort of the, 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 the mechanics of sound. Right, right. And, um, and I think of sound, and uh, one thing I've been talking about lately is like, like this idea of what is, what is natural, what is unnatural. You know, we'll look at a thing and say, okay, that's an unnatural creation, but um, humans are natural creations. We like happy, <laughs> like we're here, we're natural, we're in a part of the natural world too. And so the mechanical is, it's, for me, it's like this thing that humans have uh, built. Or I, I say sometimes, you know, there's no, no such thing as a human-made object, only human-arranged. Um, because Carl Sagan said, if you want to make an apple pie from scratch, you must first invent the universe. You know, so we're, we're not creating atoms. We're just moving parts around. And so I think of the mechanical, it's like it's kind of almost a spiritual thing in this way because it's we're, when I'm moving something around, it's, it's, it's in line with my instincts, my experience of the world, my interactions with other people. And so I try to look at the mechanical not as something separate from humanity, but something that's very much of humanity and a part of the natural world in a weird way. Yeah, I love that. You know, you, I asked you to read a poem earlier, uh, if you wouldn't mind. 
and I think we had said you're going to read I Have This Way of Being, yeah. which is on page 47. Um, I'm hoping you'll do that for me. Oh, that'd be great. Yeah, and uh, you can either talk to me or talk to the camera, whatever you prefer. Oh, but okay. I've seen your performances, and they're pretty powerhouse. Oh, thanks, yeah, man. Yeah. Appreciate it. Oh. I have this way of being. I have this. And this isn't a mouth full of the names of odd flowers I've grown in secret. I know none of these by name, but have this garden now. And pastel somethings bloom near the others and others. I have this trial, these overalls, this ridiculous hat now. This isn't a lung full of air. Not a fist full of weeds that rise, yellow, then white, then windswept. This is little more than a way to kneel and fill gloves with sweat. So that the trial in my hand will have something to push against. Rather, something to push against that it knows will bend and give and return as sprout and petal and sepal and bloom. And that's great. Jamal May, pushing the Detroit literary scene forward. The new book is The Big Book of Exit Strategies. Really a pleasure to have you here. Yeah, a pleasure to be here, man. Thanks, Thanks a lot. so much.